Um, before uh, I get started, I just want to say this is my first time at one of these events, and Ken, uh, you and your team have done a great job. So just uh, I look forward to uh, visiting with more of these, but uh, yes, it's been a great time. I'm glad to hear. So quick little background about myself. My name is Wes Minter. I'm the director of uh, Casey Water. Uh, I uh, originally, uh, actually downstate, born and bred just around Springfield, Illinois, all this talk about energy and the grid and everything else, little sidebar, I actually grew up a mile and a half away from a Commonwealth Edison power plant that they built in the 50s because there was a large coal mine there and they decided it was cheaper to build a power plant and ship the power up to Chicago than it was to put it, all the coal on a train and send it up here. So it's kind of a ironic, little small irony, um, you know, coming up here talking about energy when... Uh, you know, as a little kid, and all I did was stare at the power plant and want to go up to the top of it all the time. So um, just a quick little, some things about Kansas City. Um, kind of my angle on this is public-private partnerships. We have a lot of good things going on in Kansas City when we have worked with the private sector. And I know a lot of stuff on P3s. You know, P3s mean a lot of stuff to a bunch of different people. But to me, uh, our successful P3s, or public-private partnerships, or when we actually work with the private sector to achieve our goals and mission. And so one of the biggest things that uh, happened for us, you know, we're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. We're the Silicon Prairie. You know, we were founded in the 18, early 1800s as the uh, place where you get off the boat uh, coming up from New Orleans or Chicago, and you hopped on a, uh, a wagon to head out to the West Coast. And so that was kind of our genesis. But we were the first Google Fiber City uh, back in, uh, I guess it's almost been 10 years now. But uh, you know, we've got a citywide uh, between us and Kansas City, our partner city in Kansas City, Kansas. We've got a one gigabyte fiber serving most of the city. Um, one interesting thing, too, is uh, you get off, uh, shipment comes off the port of L.A., hops on a train, goes to the middle of nowhere, Texas, New Mexico, Kansas. First stop is in Kansas City. And so we are developing a large intermodal facility uh, on the Kansas side, which has helped us on the Missouri side as we get, uh, we've got a big monstrous 1,300 um, uh, acre uh, industrial facility up by our airport because of our logistics and the fact that, you know, we are that first stop. And I know that there's a lot of log jams here in Chicago. So we've got some good things going. Another uh, great thing we have going on is back, uh, it's, it's what I showed on the, the slide there on the left. Back in 2014, 2015, we did a uh, smart city initiative when that was first coming around and that was becoming the new hot thing in government. We actually partnered with Cisco and Sprint to install a free city Wi-Fi along our downtown streetcar route. And so the way that worked, we provided $3.7 million. Cisco and Sprint chipped in $15 million. And then we have a licensing agreement where uh, we get a portion of the ad revenue that comes out of uh, their program that they use on that. So it does a couple things. We recovered our costs through that, but then also too, it uh, helped our entrepreneurs and anybody along our downtown streetcar businesses or residents uh, having that free Wi-Fi to help with our digital divide. Um, kind of the newest hot thing now that we have going on, it's extremely exciting, um, you know, because of the cost of our water and the cost of our power. We have 16 planned data centers. Uh, Diode Ventures, which is a, an arm of Black & Veatch Corporation, which is a large consulting uh, company headquartered in Kansas City, they, uh, they have uh, th three of those 16 data centers have been signed out with Meta, Meta or Facebook. And so because of our, uh, our benefits there, we've got that going on. And again, that's it's public-private partnership and the fact that they are coming into town. We are working with them on permits. We're extending water line. We're looking at things like we have a uh, sanitary sewer uh, treatment plant next to it that's at capacity. And so we're in discussions with the uh, diode developers to potentially use some of our water before we treat it, treat it to the point where they can use it for the heating and cooling. And then they would discharge it to our plant to reduce some of our costs and the need to expand that plant for all that development up there. Um, we have a new airport, as Brian mentioned, a $1.7 billion deal that uh, is uh, going on great. I I'd talked to someone earlier, but, you know, one of the biggest problems with, you know, P3s and public private partnerships is when you get into municipal government and your finance agents within your division look at it strictly from a, the city sh gets the best, cheapest interest rate, and therefore we should hold all the debt financing. Well, we're going to test that with this biogas thing uh, coming up, and I'll expand on that a little bit more. But we also have, uh, you know, we've done it for everything. 
We infrastructure, uh, the data centers, the smart city network, but we have uh, in the middle there, we have a new uh, $32 million sports complex coming online. We partnered with our professional soccer, soccer team, Sporting Kansas City. Uh, it is a design, build, operate, and maintain agreement that we have with them and was uh, one of the, uh, you know, kind of the goals of that. And we were successful in it and becoming one of the host cities for the World Cup. And so just again, that's not, that's a project that we as a local government don't have the staff or expertise or the time to make successful. You know, we plow the streets, we provide, pick up the trash, uh, we police, we don't build sports facilities. And so working with uh, people that do is going to get us something really good. And on the right, uh, that's a picture of our airport with some uh, um, kind of colored areas. We have, um, I don't know how big it is, Brian. I think it's like 700, 800 acres, 3,100 acres um, that we are uh, moving forward in, uh, through a process to look at letters of interest for a potential solar array farm at KCI. So the city has all that, again, we have tons of land. Um, we got plenty of space. We bought all that land years ago for a third runway. Highly likely with the airplane industry, air, air industry and everything that's going on, we'll never need that. And so we wanna take that land and use it for something of benefit to where we can uh, you know, get uh, quite a bit of the city off the grid with the solar array. And again, public-private's partnership on that is, you know, we can provide the land, we can provide whatever we need permits wise. We would be open to the industry to come in and, you know, figure out how to work it all because, you know, we don't do solo farms. So uh, one of the challenges, uh, this is kind of a map that our, our communications people put up pretty good. Uh, that uh, pink blob is San Francisco. The green blob is Miami. The uh, kind of navy blue is Philadelphia and the bottom is Boston. And so you can see we can fit all four of those cities within Kansas City city limits. And so we've got a big challenge in the fact that we are trying to provide municipal services with kind of a, um, you know, a, a pretty stable, steady tax base, but we're, we're not Chicago, we're not New York, uh, we're not Miami, we don't have a port or anything like that. So we're trying to provide all these services and as the director of the water utility, I need to be cognizant that, you know, 25% of my rate payers make less than $31,000 a year. And so if they're fighting with the cost of housing, cost of energy and everything else, we need to be very careful about that. Um, here's kind of a chart where our rates, uh, you heard about the TARP program, you know, combined sewers. We had the same problem, except we weren't very proactive. The EPA came in and said, you shall. And uh, we're taking more of a, instead of a tunnel approach, we're taking a, gr a green infrastructure uh, standpoint on that to reduce our costs. But you can see our rates have gone up, you know, five to 10% a year. They started to go up when that consent decree came through. But we got to be very cognizant and we need to be efficient and we need to start thinking a little bit better on how to do that. So that leads me to our biosolids facility. Um, so one challenge we have is we do have the Missouri River going right through us. And so south of our river, all of our uh, waste drains to this biogas facility. Uh, and it's uh, currently right now we're building a uh, $140 million facility, which, uh, and again, I'm not a, uh, I'm a licensed engineer, but I deal with dirt and traffic and concrete. I don't deal with solids, but I have some real good people that do that. But basically what we have going on here is this $140 million facility, which is gonna treat our solid waste uh, into a uh, higher quality product, which then we could potentially use for, um, like the city of Milwaukee does, where they sell their waste for fertilizer. So we have, from what I understand, there's two, two different kinds of sludge poo. There's class A and there's class B, and we have class B, and so this will get us to class A. Apparently class A you can play in. So um, we, um, that's the reason for doing that. And then a goal also too, is we're just trying to, you know, get the most bang for our buck for our sewage treatment to keep our rates down. Um, so that was phase one, you know, kind of the benefits. When we do that and we cook that sludge, to 200 or 320 degrees or whatever it's cooked to, we are gonna generate a lot of gas byproduct. And so the choice is, do you incinerate it? Do you just release it in there? What do you do with it? And so we made this choice. I know that natural gas isn't very popular all over, but we've made the choice to look at a potential biogas facility that would take that waste byproduct that we would be wasting or burning anyways, and it could convert it to some sort of usable natural gas product that we could then sell back to our local utility. 
And uh, again, that's not something we do very often. Um, we are, uh, it's outside of the scope of our thing, but we were originally, we had released some letters of interest and we had some teams submit and we had some, con uh, you know, confidential one-on-one -on -one discussions with a lot of people. And we thought that we would, you know, because we listen to our finance department, that we would, uh, you know, provide the financing for this. And we would just basically put the money out there, solicit a, you know, a team that would, you know, design, build, and run it. Well, the only problem is, is, you know, like everyone else, uh, we're building two other major treatment plant expansions, including one of which has doubled from 40 to $80 million. And so we don't have the funding right now to pay for this biogas facility. And so one of the things we're looking at with kind of a pause and retooling our RFP here on this is that, you know, we know we're, somebody's got to pay the cost to put this facility in. The question becomes, how do you pay for it? And so what we want to look at the industry for, you know, under, you know, a some sort of type of P3 arrangement is, is there a license fee? You know, do we just provide the gas? They provide all the CapEx and then they pay us a royalty after they recover their costs. You know, how does that all get structured? We don't really have a good idea, but we're being forced to become efficient and innovative in this because we just don't have the cash to do this right now. And so that's kind of where we are with this. Um, you know, and again, this technology is changing so fast. So if we would have went traditional design bid build, we would potentially design something in two years from now, put it out there and it might be potentially obsolete because things have changed. And so the other thing too is, you know, the owner, you know, and the leader of the agency, I don't really want, you know, you saw our land mass, the cost to keep all those pipes clean, the cost to treat all those facilities, like I don't want that cost. So is there any way to put that risk and that cost off onto a private party that would own and maintain it and then you know, we don't have to worry about, you know, if something breaks or anything else. Everything's just taken care of. We just watch the gas come out and then go back in. Because um, that's really a challenge, I think, uh, you know, with all of this stuff. We're talking about building all sorts of new stuff, but how do you maintain it? How do you make it sustainable? You know, people can tolerate increases and increases, but you get to the point where, you know, wages aren't going up as much as a lot of the cost of living is. Um, we don't have it right now, but one of the options that we're, uh, you know, open to discussing with people is that fats, oil, and grease component. Um, you know, a separate facility that could potentially be used for biodiesel type things, you know, because if that fat, oil, and grease is not going into our system or it's being taken care of some other way, it reduces our operating costs on a regular traditional treatment. Um, so with that, that's kind of an overview of, of how KC Water is, you know, responding to some of the challenges we have going on with inflation, with, you know, with the impact of rate payers. Uh, we do have a couple of other uh, things that will be coming online from, you know, our perspective that would be, you know, I think of interest to some folks in this group. We have a customer management system that uh, is uh, rather old that we need to update. My kind of standard that I've told my my folks is, you know, I should be able to pay my bill or if somebody calls, you know, because I do have uh, elected officials who seem to call at 5.30 on Friday night because somebody's water is turned off because they haven't paid it in three months. But I need to be able to like look up somebody's account, you know, and, 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 and get that customer service log. And in theory, right, you know, if somebody calls in, does a 311 ticket or has an issue, you know, you should be able to dispatch the work order, you know, and it goes out to somebody. And then in you know, ideally, what would make the most sense is the customer. Everybody has, you know, you hear the argument, digital divide, all that other stuff, but pretty much everyone has a cell phone nowadays, knows how to use it, um, especially my 87-year-old uh, aunt. Um, but, you know, why aren't, you know, we need to send out messages. Like if I'm coming to your house, you know, I know private sectors does it, but, you know, the city should have that where it basically says, you know, John is on his way to his house and will be there at 3.30. Um, because from an employee standpoint, you know, if, if we have uh, folks that are showing up to people's houses with ring doorbells and everything else, you know, it's just a matter of time where somebody may show up and somebody may not expect it and we may have a, a, a you know, unsafe or tragic situation. So how can we be more customer and employee friendly as we start working through this stuff? And so that's one of the things I'm looking forward to is that new customer management system and how we can integrate our operational sides that we were talking at our table where, you know, lots of PLSs have 12 or 15 different legacy software systems. And in theory, right, it 
should all just kind of magically tie together. Um, so that's kind of our, our goal and objective. And then Kansas City as a whole, looking at a new uh, financial system, uh, we'll be looking and just developing something uh, for that over the next couple of years. And so we've got a lot of things that, uh, you know, private sector would be extremely helpful in uh, helping us get to where we need to get to. And, uh, you know, like I said, you know, there's 103 people in my uh, in the water department and we have 304. 84 vacancies. And so we are struggling just to provide services right now. And so anytime we can work with our private partners to get people to come in and help us think, because we don't really have the time to think, because we're just focused on the basics is always beneficial. And so I look forward to attending more of these, Ken. I think these are great. And uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions.